had a good time the last time I was on a panel at this event about five minutes ago. <laughs> There we go. Okay, I'm Harvey Stein. I'm not going to introduce myself again. Uh, if you weren't here earlier, you can ask somebody else who was or look it up. And uh, let's go through the rest of the panel here and they, everybody can introduce themselves, say a little bit about what they're interested in. Cool. Uh, my name's Hugo Van Anderson. Um, I work for a company called Data Camp. We teach online data science, machine learning, and AI education. Um, I work in a lot of curriculum development. Um, data evangelism, advocacy, lowering the barrier to what I call, um, you know, lowering computational and da data anxiety a, a lot of the time, um, and figuring out with business leaders how to approach their, their data-driven and, and AI transformations also. That's pretty much it. Hi, William Bell. I uh, lead corporate development at Naveen, and as part of that, I also co-head our strategic venture capital program, which is really more about just taking LP stakes in a few select venture capital funds that we view as close partners for um, information and, and intelligence gathering on the marketplace. And through that, we've also started to take a lot more interest in AI and artificial intelligence and how that could impact our overall business model, both at the TI level as well as at the Nuveen level, uh, from incorpor incorporating new alternative data sources as well as new ways of basically creating investment algorithms to predict the market. Hi, my name is Patricia Kondek. I work for Hitachi Labs. I head up FinTech Strategy. Um, we're based out of uh, Silicon Valley. Um, our lab is mainly interested in um, a few research themes, um, quantum computing, <laughs> data analytics, blockchain. So all the buzzwords we heard today, we're sort of getting in the mud and trying to figure out how that's supposed to work. Um, I also look at a lot of uh, fintech trends, startups out of Silicon Valley, and think a lot about the future of fintech. Great. I'm Arnab Chatterjee, uh, Senior Vice President at a company called Metadata. I oversee our products. Um, so Metadata is uh, one of the world's largest clinical trial software companies. I've uh, been around for about 20 years, and 10 of which have been public. And then probably about three, four months ago, we got acquired by a large French aerospace company called Dassault Systeme uh, out of Paris. Um, so. Most of our focus is going to be on helping power their life sciences work, um, but we kind of sit on a, one of the, I think, the largest clinical trials database in the world, so how do we start to think about ways of uh, powering drug discovery or coming up with better ways of using you know, AI, machine learning, that type of data science on this data set that we sit on? Okay, great. So uh, since we're talking about 20 years after the dot-com bubble, uh, what do you, you know, since the bursting of that bubble, what do you think were the biggest, most lasting changes that we've seen? Anybody? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start at the risk of being provocative. Uh, one of the biggest changes after the dot-com dot -com bubble was the, um, probably the adoption of advertising models in, in, in tech companies. Uh, essentially, you know, if you go back and read uh, Bryn and Page's um, landmark paper that, you know, led to the PageRank algorithm, and essentially, they actually, in an appendix, talk about the mixed incentives of the advertising model and how they would hopefully never uh, adopt it, essentially. When the dot-com bubble uh, burst, um, and the VCs were in, in, in frenzy, essentially, um, they decided then to AdWords had had some success. They decided to push, push this model, which now we've seen Facebook, in particular, also, also adopt, um, and essentially, Probably the rise of what Shoshana Zuboff would call surveillance capitalism is, is due to the dot-com burst um, in, in, in a lot of ways. So that's one of the biggest changes we've seen. Yeah, maybe I can comment on the healthcare perspective. Um, you know, so healthcare tends to be a laggard compared to other industries generally, but I think the thing that's changed the most is just how much data has just come together and, and you know, the confluence of different types of data to evaluate what healthcare is is really interesting. So most people say 80% of your health is actually based on your social determinants of health and, and things that sit outside of you know, the actual clinic and the, the healthcare center. Um, and what you're seeing now, you know, we, we talked in the last panel about tech companies kind of making a play in the space. If you really think about you know, where your genomic profile fits and where your medical record fits and where your sensor data fits and how it ties into this larger you know, clinical profile, 
how is that data being used now? And, and there's obviously privacy implications behind all of this, but you know, the fact that 23andMe and, and Ancestry.com are creating drug development companies out of your data because they have your spit you know, is an interesting way to think about the world now. Um, alternatively, what it, would be, what it would be like if um, you know, Facebook was used in clinical trials and to help with recruitment. Um, in a previous life, I spent a lot of time working with Google, Apple, and Facebook on their healthcare strategy. I was at McKinsey for a number of years, and you know, a lot of the stuff that came up was what is the right safe way, but also the most powerful way to make a dent in the space. So we're hitting kind of all different axes now on what's going to happen in these, in these types yeah. of spaces with tech companies. I think what I've seen is just in the embracement of technology. And so, you know, even the bank, they don't want to be a bank anymore. They want to be a tech company with a banking license. So I think that mindset where people are really incorporating tech and data into all sorts of processes that we haven't seen before, is the biggest change. I mean, I'll, I'll just say that, you know, one of the things that I, I view is actually quite different this time around, and obviously the dot-com bubble, what it did really was wipe out a lot of tenuous at best business models, and we're starting to see that reemerge again today. Uh, what's different this time, though, is that back in the dot-com bubble, the companies had to basically raise venture capital and fund the full tech stack. And nowadays, what you're seeing is with things like Amazon Web Services and cloud computing, that startups can really just start very easily and it's led to a much wider proliferation of, di of varying business models. So, you know, you're seeing a lot more, you're, you're still seeing a lot of tenuous at best business models, but there's also, in, in an ironic fashion, a lot of downside protection too from that because these companies can scale down their cost quite dramatically when they reach sort of an inflection point or tough markets ahead. So you're basically saying that, uh, that with cloud computing and other components, the internet, cloud computing, other components that we've essentially made it far easier for the startups to start up. We basically created, in some sense, uh, the ability for anybody to have a garage startup. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Instead, you can take $1,000 and you know, get mm -hmm. an Amazon you know, server going well, you still have and to pay, scale it up, you know, scale it down. You still got to pay for your grocery bill. But. Right, but instead of having to raise $5 million by mm -hmm. you know, a bunch of server racks and, and get connected that way, it's, it's a lot mm -hmm. more manageable. I, I, I totally agree with that. I'll just add to that that it's cloud computing in general, but as you say, Amazon in particular, who have made it so cheap, well, far is, cheaper than the, than the other platforms. And, yeah. that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's an interesting point you bring up because I'm thinking about pre.com to post.com. Pre.com, who did we have? We had IBM and Microsoft, right? And uh, some of the other big tech companies. And they were all building computers or building, writing software and selling it or, well, maybe leasing it, I guess. Microsoft, in some sense, was leasing it more than selling it, but nonetheless. Um, now, post.com, what do we have? Google, Facebook, Amazon, they're not even selling products, right? A they're Apple, building... Apple still is. Apple, yeah, Emma. out of the four. Really? Apple is the, one that's the only one that's still selling a product. The other ones are selling you, right? They're collecting your data and selling it, and they're giving you the products that they actually develop for, well, to some, well, cheaply, if not free, which is kind of a bizarre model now. The biggest uh, tech companies, biggest, most powerful tech companies, the biggest innovators now aren't selling the products that they develop. You, this is a really interesting point, in particular because you may have noticed that recently Apple have started differentiating themselves on privacy. Like, I get targeted ads telling me how private Apple will be with, with my data. And they, <laughs> they can afford to do that, right? Because that, they're not in... You know, they do use our behavioral surplus to target stuff, but they're not in the business of, of that per se. As you say, they still make products, right? And I think to add to that, I think it, who owns the customer relationship these days, and that, that's a Facebook, and that, that is these sort of platforms. But you also see sort of wherever there's a revolution, there's always a counter-revolution, right? So there's also people fighting for this greater transparency and all these other sort of regulations sort of trying to curb that, that, you know, you can't just amass all this data and then just, you know, sort of sell it. So I think there will be a lot of countermeasures as well to this trend. Also, uh, I mean, going along those lines, I think, you know, Google is becoming the new Microsoft in certain respects. I mean, if you, if you remember back when uh, Microsoft was selling Word and and uh, Windows, and they were blocking development of Word on Apple's platforms because they wanted to sell more Windows. You're seeing similar things now with Google, where uh, you, know, you can't get Miracast on your, on your phone to mirror your screen onto your TV because they're selling uh, Chromecast. 
I'll, I'll just add one more yeah. th thing to that. that. So these companies aren't necessarily interested in selling our data. They're interested in selling prediction products that they build for, from our data, right? Um, and there is a future and present world in which, you know, the idea of selling a prediction product is you want to predict something as accurately as possible. Um, and what they're also doing is essentially trying to change people's behavior in order to make their predictions as accurate as possible. So one example that I find really telling is Pokemon Go, uh, which you know took the world by storm a few years ago. Little known fact, um, uh, made by Niantic Labs, which was an internal startup developed in Google. Um, and Pokemon Go allowed cafes, restaurants, bars to essentially buy Pokemon to have in their store in order to get business. And they, Google and Niantic Labs, experimented with a paper visit model, analogous to their pay-per-click model at, at the time. So essentially, changing our behavior in, in order to, to make revenue. Yeah. And all that's, uh, all that's because of the ubiquity of the internet right now. That everybody, as I mentioned on the previous panel, right, uh, at least my personal view, everything is, we're so interconnected now through the wires, through the, uh, you know, everybody has their phone out. I've got mine over here because I have the notes for this uh, panel on it. And, uh, and you, don't get your, you don't get your news through the, uh, through the radio waves anymore, to your television, to your radio. You get it through the internet, right? It's all digitized and it's all going through the internet now, which is kind of amazing, an amazing difference that you've got such an ability, you've, you've lowered the barriers so much for one person to kind of just shout out to everybody. You don't have to be on a soapbox with a speaker, you know, in the park. You just post it on Facebook, you post it on LinkedIn, uh, you, you post some video on YouTube. So yeah. it's, it's like a tremendous, it, it, it's that, in, in some, I think to a lot, uh, a lot of what we're observing now is all uh, consequences of that interconnectivity. It's like uh, building the highways, right? It's, it's like before you had highways, how did you get from A to B? It was very difficult. And after the investment of the highways, it changed the whole face of the country. I was going to say that, I mean, that you can just actually look at the transformation in the news industry and how much that has, you know, come along in the last 20 years or how much that's changed. And, you know, looking back at Warren Buffett, he was famous for one of the things that he really liked was owning local newspapers because every person in that town would have to buy the local newspaper in order to know what the what the news was, and that therefore it was like a, he had a toll road and that he could collect the the fees off of it forever. Um, today, that business model is is very much under a lot of duress, and you know, very few people subscribe to newspapers. Uh, they're they're experimenting with online, but it's it's really you know proven to be quite difficult, and they're appealing to just people's good nature and wanting to be good citizens to support journalism in a way that helps uncover some of the you know the, the things that you know, journalists will do. Okay. Maybe to, maybe to give a different perspective because that's a lot about B two C. Um, we work a lot with um, heavy industries, factories. And if you look at those types of sort of businesses, they haven't used data as much as we have as consumers. So they're really starting out still on that journey and that catching up. So industrial AI, using IoT in factories, you know, you'd be surprised that some of the major automotive manufacturers don't even know yet. It's still handwritten how they're maintaining their machines. So there's still a big wave that I think needs to happen in order for that connectedness to even spread amongst heavy industries and other areas. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that I mean, that's a, an important point because there is, the, 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 if you look at what AI technology is capable of today, I mean, it actually could automate a lot of jobs that are out there today right now. What, what's challenging about it is one, you don't have the expertise among the decision makers inside these companies to be able to really understand the, both the capabilities as well as the limitations of AI. And you also have to very narrowly define the use case of it and, and get highly specific training for how that AI algorithm will ultimately perform. So you're, and also you're, you're somewhat limited by the amount of data and training sets that you need in order to properly take a, and, you, and implement a sophisticated deep learning algorithm. And, you know, if you think about, you know, right now I've got a two-year-old and a four-year-old, and um, if I'm, you know, 
trying to teach my two-year-old what a taxi is, I show him a taxi once and he knows what a, what a taxi is, maybe he'll misidentify a yellow car as a taxi, but for the most part he's going to get it right pretty quickly. Instead of with an AI algorithm, you need to show it like 100,000 images of a taxi before it finally understands what it is and doesn't make you know a lot of those common, right. easy, easy to identify I think errors. I think you're, you're hitting kind of the nail on the head with AI. That's kind of almost the next hurdle in AI is context, right? Your kids are living in the real world, constantly interacting with the world. The world follows certain physical laws, and they learn those laws. And that enables them to have the context and the infrastructure to be able to identify a taxi quickly, right? Whereas these machine learning approaches to image recognition, you're training it on a bunch of images. It's, you're not telling it the physics behind it. You're not telling it how these, it's not in interacting with them. It's not experiencing how these things work what's creating the images. It's just an analyzing images outside of the context. And as a result, you end up with this fragility in these models. The, uh, you know, another, another example is the self-driving cars. You have the same problem. Uh, news sentiment analysis, the same problem. You know, you can see it, you, you get an article that, uh, you know, that, some, that a company exceeded their earnings estimates well, if it was expected that they were to exceed it more, then that's negative news, not positive news. So, you know, understanding the context, which is just orders of magnitude bigger, is, is really what you need to get to to be able to have really ubiquitous AI, I think. Yeah, I mean, this is a big um, argument happening in the healthcare industry now around whether AI is going to replace jobs. And, you know, obviously the larger economic force here is that there are presidential candidates who are saying that automation is going to take over a certain portion of jobs and we have to prepare ourselves against the machines. Um, so in healthcare, you know, the, the big example is around imaging. Um, so imaging is about 90% of all the healthcare data generated right now. And you're seeing this in x-rays or PET scans or CT scans. Um, there was a Harvard Business Review article that came out uh, maybe about a year or two ago. And it was headlined, you know, will AI replace radiologists? You know, and this is a real question, um, you know, because the most recent work shown by Google um, and a few other companies is that if you have enough imaging data, um, and they did this with uh, retinal fundus images from your eyes, they were able to outperform um, ophthalmologists. You know, a, a panel of eight ophthalmologists performed worse than an AI algorithm that Google created. So there's real questions around it, but the flip side is that these are usually very binary decisions. It's like, is it a tumor, is it not a tumor? And then there's a larger holistic body of evidence around how a patient should be treated. Um, the other side of this equation is, um, you know, Harvey and I were talking about this this morning, you know, we talked a little bit about on the last panel about bias in, in algorithms and um, the most, I guess, glaring example of this is probably about two weeks ago, uh, United Healthcare has a data analytics arm called Optum um, that has been racially biasing against uh, African Americans uh, when it comes to how the patients should be treated. And it's, it, race wasn't even part of the algorithm. It was just how income uh, was used. And we all know, you know there's disproportionate um, or disparities in, in income levels across uh, different minority groups. And that was something that the algorithm hadn't taken into account. So we're getting to a place now where these algorithms are dictating you know, some aspects of clinical care, some aspects of how you're going to get billed as part of your insurance company, ultimately even how your radiologist starts to treat you, which is a very different place to yeah. play in. I've actually got a question for Arnab. You and I have discussed this before. We just mentioned the fact that you know Google has kind of some sort of monopoly around information in a lot of ways. Um, they're entering a lot of spaces, including health. As someone who works in health, how do you feel about big tech coming in and, and demonstrating these proof of principles? Yeah, it's um, it's interesting, right? So the big three or big four. So if you look at Amazon, Apple, Google, and Facebook, are all in our healthcare space in some ways. Some more meaningful than others. Um, so one thing is like there's just a gigantic data arms race in healthcare right now and, and has been for some time. At first it was insurance and billing claims data and then it became your medical records once those became available and now it's your genomic data and it kind of goes on and on. So for a company like Google and others, frankly, um, they're chasing right now, where can we get the most imaging data? Is it within radiology practices? Is it within organizations like Nokia, for example, that have access to uh, you know, medical facilities? Is it GE? You know, there are these reservoirs of this information which they treat like treasure troves. They can train their algorithms and they feel like they can make a huge substantial dent on healthcare. Um, I think it's a necessary thing. If you think about what's happening at Google right now, uh, they recently hired the head of Google Healthcare, and they're going through a massive reorganization, is a guy named David Feinberg, who's a very well-respected 
former CEO of Geisinger, which is like a flagship academic medical center. Um, they hired you know, the former FDA commissioner, Rob Califf. Um, they hired a former head of uh, tech for the White House. Um, this is not an insignificant team. These are all clinicians. They're all really legit people. And it means that they're trying to figure it out. Um, this is not a, a one or two year well, thing. Google's been at it for 10 no, plus I mean, years. So. People, have, people have been talking for a while about how if you could access all the medical records and, anal and all the treatments that, were, that people had undergone and start you know, doing a large scale data analysis, you could really do a lot to further medicine. And the, kind of the, the hurdles to that have been access to it and privacy laws. But it still leaves the question, how do we find um, better training data going back to the bias? Because the data is just reflecting back the biases that we have built in over the years. So right. how, how do, how well, do we even, deal with that? It's potentially even worse than that, right? I mean, because you, uh, you have anti bias laws, discrimination laws, that uh, your, your uh, machine learning solution might, in fact, uh, put you at risk by violating the law. How do you show that, you know, that you, that you uh, after training your model, that it's not discriminating? Yeah, I think the question is not anymore if your model is biased, it's how your model is biased these days. So. There are lots of types of bias, right? So there's first order bias where, as we've seen, Amazon's recruiting tool um, was biased against uh, female candidates um, because the training data was, was biased. Um, on top of that, there's second order bias where if you have um, underrepresented groups in your, like gr just groups that have less people in your training data, your prediction will be less certain. Um, and so in that case, people will be less likely to target an ad, an ad at you or to offer you, offer you a job as well. Um, I think this is gonna be a greater and greater concern where, I don't know if anyone saw, Booz, Booz Allen just um, launched uh, an algorithms marketplace. Um, so with our, like if we're having models that have been trained on data sold and used for transfer learning without any knowledge of what data goes into them, this is a very dangerous time. Yeah, and, and, and one important piece of regulatory stuff here before we move on to our next topic is, um, so the FDA has actually approved 32 algorithms since 2014. So when we say approved, so when Apple um, you know, uses HealthKit or ResearchKit uh, and they do it to monitor your cardiac arrhythmia, that is an approved algorithm by the FDA. Um, so a few of these device companies that monitor your glucose levels or things like that are actually, they've been run through the ringer by the FDA, they've done all the bias checks, and these are things that are actually used in clinical screening now, legally, by the FDA. So what does that mean for different types of patient populations or how robust were those screening methods, right? I love that. And I, I, I think... Definitely thinking about an FDA for algorithms in general will be really exciting. Um, and of course, in, in these examples, a lot, a lot goes, goes into it, then the algorithms are used. Another question is what you, what you do with algorithms and models that are continuously in production. How would you audit, for example, the Facebook feed algorithm? Um, and you probably need other algorithms to help yeah, you do no, so. I mean, it's a tremendous, tremendous problem in, in risk management in general. I, mean, I would go on these panels and people would always be asking, Oh, well, how are you going to use machine learning and risk management? And I was like, no, 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 that's not the right question. The question is, how are you going to risk manage all of these machine learning algorithms? You know, there, you, there's a certain opacity, there's a certain lack of knowledge that's going into the development of the algorithms. You've got, basically, it's almost like, you know, you've given everybody these shiny new toys to play with, and they build these models, and they think they're data scientists now, when they've never even looked at this data before, I mean, if, you've, if anybody with statistics background knows that if you haven't spent 80% or more of your time looking at the data before you even started the modeling, then you're probably not doing it right. Yet, uh, this is what we're, you know, kind of almost promoting by the ease with which these, uh, these uh, techniques can be employed. Well, I mean, it isn't the genie somewhat out of the bottle on this one in that, you know, people, when they are given the opportunity to short circuit, you know, developing an algorithm from scratch and getting together the massive data set they need to. Instead, they can just go purchase a pre-existing algorithm, implement some transfer learning, and all of a sudden they've got a, you know, an algorithm doing effectively what they need it to. And, you know, that you, you could expect that process would proliferate quite a bit. I think to that point that a lot of the investment in the future in AI is not going to be about the technology, it's going to be about the governance, the adoption, 
and, and sort of this explainable AI concept where people will, may have to backtrack their models to show exactly what has been happening. And that's very costly. I think Facebook set aside three to five billion to actually backtrack a lot of their models and show what it's doing. Yeah. And it's a pretty difficult problem when you're running these, uh, fitting these complex models to your data sets. So we'll see where that goes. Um, Harvey, is it worth covering like the wins in the space? Because I feel like we've been doom and gloom for the last hour and a half, and I feel like it's worth, uh, at least we talked about this for a few minutes, like how are we capturing good things that are happening? <laughs> right. So, um, so yeah, it's, you know, I, I feel like all the AI machine learning, people are even talking about quantum computing, which isn't really a thing yet, as we discussed in the last panel, but there are advances being take, uh, taking place. Um, so at least in the healthcare space, right? So we talked about the difficulties in using AI and, and data for uh, diagnosing patients, but the flip side of it is actually on the biotech side. So in a room full of people working in the investment world, there's been you know, tens of billions of dollars that have gone into AI for drug discovery. And these are basically taking all this information on molecules and how do you start to like better isolate which target you go after, right? So in phase two, only 15% of clinical trials actually get to market. Um, if you think about a space like ALS, um, in the last uh, 20 years, there have been 50 clinical trials and only two drugs have come out of it, neither of which are actually effective. So this is a graveyard for a lot of spaces, right, and for a lot of drugs. So if you can use AI, um, a lot of the big advancements coming out of drug development and where the real money is, is frankly around how do you isolate just one target that can expedite your clinical trial pathway by 6, 12, 18 months. That's you know, billions of dollars in savings right there, but it's also an improvement in patient lives considering that the average clinical trial takes you know, about 12 to 14 years right now to get a drug to market. So you know, there's tons of activity in that space. There's professors getting into the business. Um, Boston and Cambridge are these huge biotech hubs right now, but ones that are particularly using AI for more efficiency and actually better target discovery. Yeah, maybe a fun example. We've, we work with uh, Disney, actually, and we're monitoring their physical assets, and we're using data analytics to predict, you know, if the next ride is, needs some maintenance. And so this is a sort of a real-time monitoring of their infrastructure to make the park safer and, and you know, to, to also reduce their, their operational efficiencies. Yeah, for us, I mean, we're in the early stages of this, but, you know, there's plenty of di discussion on previous panels around the alternative data that's out there, and a lot of that is enabled through AI. And then similarly, you know, we're, it's still early days, and I think there's still some work to be done on the algorithms themselves, because with markets, it's, it's not like other problems, because, you know, one, there's actually a pretty finite set of data that you can use. For instance, if you're trying to track monthly or predict monthly returns, and you have 10 years of historical data, that's actually only 120 data points, which is not nearly enough to train these models. Also, markets are, tend to be reactive, and so they're not just static systems, and you can't expect necessarily the same patterns to reemerge over and over again. But we're, we're you know, starting to look at this and seeing what you can do with AI to help make better predictions in the marketplace. Um, I'm, I'm really excited. I mean, the verticals that we initially focused on um, educating at DataCamp were fine, people in finance, tech, and, and health. I'm really interested in seeing what's happening in other spaces, such as um, ag tech, agriculture technology, with even, you know, there are startups having technologies such as drones flying over, over fields in order to optimize crop yields, which I think is really exciting. A lot of stuff in legal tech, um, natural language processing, document classification um, for you know, analyzing precedents um, in, in, in large corpora. Um, the, the other thing that's not um, vertical specific that I'm really excited about is just using like basic data analytics. I'm not even talking about AI, like to um, you know, in, increase organizational efficiency, like helping with a lot of, lot of scut work, getting you know, data literacy skills spread through organizations. It's really empowering to see someone on a customer success team write basic SQL code to dive into, in, into our database in order to make decisions around how to interact with customers. Very interesting, yeah. So, uh, you know, so this, this also, this, you, you're starting to touch on the question of what do you, exactly do we even mean when we say AI now? All right, what are we talking about machine learning and AI? We had the first AI bubble, if anybody remembers it. Maybe you guys are too young, I don't know. The, uh, I think there have been three or four, technically, AI winters, anyway. Well, I mean, I'm thinking back in the, uh, in the late 80s, essentially, was the end of the first AI bubble, where everybody was talking about uh, this was knowledge engineering, knowledge representation, expert systems, 
They were going to build, everybody, we were going to build expert systems that would replace the doctors and replace uh, uh, essentially all the experts, right? They were all going to be out of work. The machines were going to do everything. Uh, and then since there wasn't very little del actually delivered on that, we ended up with the AI winter. And now we've got what I call the second AI bubble. So how is this one different? What exactly are we, do we mean about AI? I mean, some, it's, sometimes it just sounds like we're doing statistics. Sometimes it's like glorified statistics, maybe with a little nonlinearity thrown in. Is, you know, how much is it just more statistics with more computational power? Or how much is it something completely different? I, I can speak to how data scientists use the term. They, they usually just mean some sort of machine learning in the form of a neural network, which is three or more layers deep. Um, but I've heard people use it for statistical models or logistic regression. <laughs> that is, yeah, definitely not true in healthcare. It's, it's like not even a layer deep. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, one of my favorite quotes is uh, DJ Patil, who used to be the chief data scientist in the US, would say that, you know, a data scientist is just a statistician in California. Um, you know, and that's, it's not untrue uh, in some ways. So you can think about the Sanford PhD computer scientist as sort of like, you know, the, the aspiration for you wanted a data scientist. An alternative, there's plenty of people who are doing biostats and things like that, and that's, you know, just a different kind of data science. Um, so in 1979, what I found interesting was like the cover of Fortune magazine had uh, Merck, the big pharmaceutical company, on the cover, and it said, you know, Merck is using computer-aided drug design, right, to actually change how it's discovering new molecules. And this is 1979, and then obviously we're still trying to figure it out, you know, 40 years later. But I think that's kind of still where we are. Um, you know, for most stuff in healthcare, it's the data is so bad that you're not even trying to get to AI. The, the Google things are sort of anomalies, but you're still trying to come up with better regression models. People are moving from logistics linear into some things that are slightly more advanced, random forest, things like that. But I'd say most of the R&D heads that I work with are still trying to figure out what to do with their crappy data and how to understand the data lakes and swamps that they've built within their companies, whether they're any good or not. Well, yeah, actually, we don't I, I just, you, just, you just reminded me in the, in, the, uh, in, the health, in the health sphere, right? Wasn't it the, uh, the human genome project that was going to solve all of our health problems? Yeah. And it, did not do that per se, but it's very expensive okay. and very long. But uh, yeah, we got some genetic data. We did, we did some sequencing, yeah. Sold a lot of computers there. OK, so it was good for, good for some of us. Yeah. Yes. Uh, we don't even use the term artificial intelligence that much. We just talk about data analytics and trying to help people move from descriptive, so what's happened in the past, to you know prescriptive. What's sort of the next best action that you should be taking? So this whole super AI, we, we don't even really consider that at this moment in time. No. It's, it's more a, a term of convenience, I'll say, because it, it catches a lot of things. And generally, it's defined as just when a computer is able to do things that you would normally attribute to a human being able to do, such as reading natural language or looking at an image or, or other things of that nature. Um, that's probably where it most often is used. Generally, that will be used or have underlying it a deep learning network of some sort. And, you know, I think that probably captures most of it. But you're right. I mean, it is effectively juiced up statistics. And, um, you know, it, it, it has the same limitations of a statistical model, just with some nonlinearity thrown in. I'll also add Monica Rigardi, who was an early data scientist at LinkedIn, and now she's a data, data science and AI consultant. She has a wonderful post on Hacker Noon called the AI Hierarchy of Needs. And she's essentially reformulated Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs so that AI and deep learning are at the top. And you, you see, like, the bottom is data foundation and then um, data flow, ETL, this type of stuff, then aggregating and labeling. And, you know, I, I mean, she or someone else has also said most of data science is counting correctly. Um, so. And maybe it's worth also talking about, like, what has led to the current boom in AI, right? It's, you know, in contrast to previous times that we've had this, there's now, you know, it's basically driven by three things. It's an abundance of data, it's an abundance of processing power, and it's some advances in the algorithms. And that's been what's really been fueling a lot of the innovations around it, or applications, I guess, of AI into various areas. We're probably going to start reaching the limit of what those advances will allow you to achieve, because there's still a, it's still very computationally intensive to train an algorithm. A lot of the data that's out there is unstructured, or it, you know, there's been numerous charts of the num the growth in data, which there has been a huge growth, but a lot of that is also p people taking increasingly higher resolution pictures of their friends, which isn't really necessarily going to do a whole lot in training AI algorithms. 
And so there's, there's still going to be need to be some real advances in the technology, I think, to drive us to the next phase. And I think in addition to those three, David Donahoe has identified a fourth, um, which he refers to as the common task framework, which you can see in uh, leaderboard competitions such as Kaggle. And this is the fourth aspect which has led to the spread of, of skills being widely available um, and being able to find humans to, to perform these things as, as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I look at it as being a very exciting new hammer to use. And if you've got a lot of nails, that's really great. But if you've got to fix your windows, it's not going to be so helpful. But uh, I'll also add that this is mostly true, but when you have like big models in production, such as Google search, I think this is very different to statistics or what we think of as statistical modeling. This is, you know, hardcore at scale distributed computing operating at a planetary scale, which I would not mm -hmm. refer to as statistical modeling ever. Okay, but uh, yeah, no, I think, uh, you know, sometimes orders of magnitude, orders of magnitude difference in things are fundamentally different, right? You end up with completely different approaches, completely different techniques. You know, brute force doesn't, uh, you know, it suddenly becomes like the right approach. But, uh, but what about the fragility, right? We were talking about this, how these models that we're developing now for image recognition, even in uh, natural language processing, tend to be fairly fragile, easily, easily diverted by uh, slight changes in pictures or word order or things of this sort. That they're kind of working correctly on a statistical basis at 80 or 90 percent accuracy, but the other 10 is, you know, it can be exploited to uh, kind of drive the, drive the uh, self-driving car off the cliff. Yeah, maybe I can start. Um, so the, the, I guess, somewhat public downfall of IBM Watson in healthcare has been well documented now. And a lot of it was because the oncology, the cancer treatment models that they were creating were basically coming out of Sloan Kettering, which is not representative of MD Anderson, which is not representative of you know, a health, uh, an oncology clinic in California. And that's usually the biggest problem for healthcare models, at least. It's just not an epidemiologically representative portion of our population. So everything you build, whether it's within a large medical system, um, is still sort of an N of one. You're kind of just capturing that moment in time of that set of data for that healthcare population. And that's why I go back to this data arms race thing, because everyone's sort of chasing this uh, unicorn of coming up with this massive US-based uh, you know, medical state, uh, data set that also has your genomic data, that also has your billing record. So you could look at this longitudinally and say, this is what happened in 10 years, and I can predict disease. So the fragility of it is, is super fragile. Like It is actually a very difficult thing to scale. And what everybody wants to do is come up with like a better clinical alert that you can put into the system. So the doctor says, ah, you patient X, you have X, Y, and Z, and now I should treat you with you know this because this is what the data is telling me. We're still a long way from that. So I think about this a lot in the context of bad actors and adversarial attacks. What well, one, one example that's come to light recently, a lot of self-driving car algorithms can recognize stop signs. Um, but some hackers have figured out a, a pixelated image that they can stick on a stop sign that stops most of these algorithms recognizing the stop sign as a stop sign. This is known as yeah, mm -hmm. an adversarial attack. These are bad actors. Um, a lot of development of these algorithms take this into account now. So it's almost like a training arms race in, in, in a lot of ways uh, as well to you know, have creative minds in such organizations figuring out the space of adversarial attacks well, and using them into the model it's building like process. you're talking about white hat you know white hat hackers black hat hackers right but uh, you know is that but our computers are still getting hacked <laughs> so do we have any uh, questions from the audience you guys have yes throw that man a mic Thank you for uh, a lot of uh, good insights, some of which controversial, some of which not. Um, I wanted to throw a controversial question to you. Um, remember Matrix and how people were supposed to just produce energy for the AI overlords? Don't you think it's almost like that, except instead of, you know, just heat and energy, we just produce data? Sure. <laughs> well, no, more, more seriously, um, 
you know, one analogue, I don't think it's a perfect analogue, but think about the Industrial Revolution and how we didn't have labour movements or tariff laws and that type of stuff. And, you know, there was, you know, as Patricia alluded to earlier, you have a movement of market forces and um, capitalist, among other things, dynamics and surveillance capital. Um, and then another movement comes to reassert all of our shared, shared values. Um, I, yeah, I'm, I'm concerned that this will happen in kind of really, like, brute force legislative fashions that don't understand the possibility of technology, um, you know, like happened with nuclear, for, for example. I can see there being a huge pushback at that level as opposed to from... Well, it doesn't have to be, you know, it could be the government passing laws. It could also just be the tort system, right? You know, when that, self, that Google self-driving car hits someone, who do you think they're going to sue? And what do you think the jury is going to say? Right? Oh, yeah, give them a billion dollars. Okay, it kind of changes the whole, uh, you know, the whole profit ratio on building and selling self-driving cars. And I think it, I mean, it's a pretty dark statement. But, um, I mean, in Europe, they're really looking at putting the consumer back in control of their own data. And I think there will be some more common platforms where, for example, all of your banking information from your five different banks will come in and you will have control over who you give that data to. So that's sort of far in the future. I do see some of those more um, sharing of data in the con and the consumer at the, at the steering wheel, hopefully. Well, that's, that's happening right now. It's called the General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR. Yeah, I think... Um so everyone watches those Boston Robotics videos and they get terrified because like these robotic cheetahs are going to come after you, right? <laughs> and that actually happens at MIT or I live in Boston and you see like random robotic cheetahs running around, it's terrifying. Um, so uh, I think in healthcare, it's probably the other extreme, right? Like it, it's how much good you're doing versus this one bad apple or this one bad example of algorithmic bias and that kind of ruins it for all the other companies that are trying to do promising things. And you wonder how much, and this is what the big tech companies fear, is like how much regulation is going to come in once those incidents start to pile up, right? And they already are happening. A lot of it we're just not noticing or we're not seeing it. It's under the radar. Um, but it's, it's, you know, it requires that one New York Times headline, like the Amazon one that you referenced, that said that, you know, there's recruiting bias or there's something happening bad in healthcare. And this uh, United Healthcare one's a really bad one for like how we're mistreating patients. So. It's, it's going to go the other way around, I feel like. A little bit of backlash. We, yeah, we are seeing that with legislation against facial recognition technology. Uh, California is trying to introduce some bills that are GDPR-esque. Um, so there are a lot of things happening. Interesting. Yes, we have a question here. Yeah, hi, uh, Andre. I've taught uh, med school at two of the larger med schools here in New York City. I teach uh, neuroscience and biophysics. And I can very clearly understand that there's nothing that med professors are teaching to people who are going to be the next physicians, the next nurses, the next physician assistants, anywhere in the interaction with the client itself. Anything about what, we, what we've been hearing all day today about technology, about data, bioinformatics, all of the incredible things that we are hearing about. How if they don't know this, and they are not being taught anything about this here at all, as, as you, you're probably aware, how will their patients be able to deal with this here going forward when, when all of a sudden these things happen? And this change is going to happen very quickly. This switchover is going to happen in the, court, in, in the case of days or weeks or months. But you're going to have physicians or healthcare providers who are totally clueless, like absolutely totally clueless about what it means. What does that mean? Yeah, so that's a really interesting question. Um, so maybe I can point to two different examples. Um, so I guess the first thing is that, you know, it's going to take some time. Like, if you think about what happened with medicine and electronic medical records, right? Electronic medical records have been around since the 90s. Legislation from the um, Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2008 actually made financial incentives for doctors to start to implement them. And now physicians in their fourth year of med school will have to go through a really boring and super rigorous and really long um, med school training, or uh, uh, EMR training course, medical record training course, on how to bill accurately, right? So there's these forcing mechanisms, and they are cumbersome and annoying and actually create more physician burden than you think. Um, so I, I uh, teach over at Harvard Med, and um, over time, the course curriculum has actually evolved where bioethics, biostatistics, and epidemiology are now first-year requirements, as, long as, as, as well as health policy, uh, the, the course that I teach. And that's 
actually just something that changed in the last couple of years because there was almost this necessity, this foundational physician education that had to take place before this happens. I foresee, just based on the way that some of the courses are changing, at least in that med school, that you know, there's classes on drug development now, there's classes on like pharma's interaction with physicians. Like There are these greater ecosystem forces that are going to come into play, and I bet in five years you're going to start to see this like data science for physicians in, and nurses and others within the training curriculum. Yeah, I mean... Uh... You know, you always think of, of academia as kind of the forefront of the progress of knowledge, but a lot of times it's actually, when you talk about the courses that are being taught and the curriculums, it's often lagging. And that's, I think, what you're experiencing. I mean, I remember when I was in, in college at WPI in uh, 78 to 82, and they did have bioethics classes and technology, impact of technology on bi biology and ethics. and. Uh, you know, that, that's, I think, one, one line where you might see a resurgence. But uh, a lot of this comes after the fact, and the technologists come in and hire some doctors with some venture capital, and before you know it, who knows what they built. Uh, I think we're pretty much out of time. Does anybody want to give, like, a, a 10-second commentary? Otherwise, we'll say... Good night to everybody, and welcome to the reception. Um, <laughs> sure. Uh, so the thing that makes me laugh about all of our talk about AI, so we're certainly making some advances, and then uh, one of my favorite professors, uh, Dan Ariely at Duke, who you guys probably know, big um, psychologist, economist, um, always says that you know even before AI, there's big data, and big data is like teenage sex. Uh, everyone thinks they know what they're doing, and everyone claims that they're doing it, but nobody actually has any idea what they're doing. So that's kind of how I think about the AI okay. space now and where we're at. Great. And to add to that, and I think that we, we talk about big data, but we usually don't even have big data. We just yeah. have some data. And, you know, how often does a mining equipment fail? We don't have that much data to use, actually. So mm -hmm. I think we dropped the whole big, big data thing off the big. I'll add, I, I mentioned David Donohoe before. He, I, I like something he yeah. said about artificial intelligence. He said most of it should be called recycled in, intelligence. Because um, a lot of the time, as we've discussed, it requires humans to hand label lots and lots of images, and then we get machines to replicate what, what we've done and essentially recycle our intelligence, as opposed to create a new uh, artificial intelligence. Okay. And I'll just say that I, I probably won't stand in, in the way of drinks any longer, so. <laughs> okay. So with that, uh, with that brave new world of uh, technology, thank you all for being here. And I think if that, if what happens, if it goes the way we think it goes, maybe we do need a drink. So good night. <laughs>